Back to this episode of Uncover the Human. Uh, it's just Christina and I this week. Hey, Christina, how's it going? Oh, great. <laughs> it's uh, it's twenty twenty two. Very confident. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those it like it's you. it's after the holidays it's two years of pandemic it's like how cheery do you actually want to be on january 5th 2022 not sure <laughs> yet <laughs> it's on hold <laughs> we're gonna find out if this uh recording lifts or breaks the spirit <laughs> <laughs> yes indeed we wanted to talk this week a little bit uh just a a a topic that's kind of near and dear to anyone who works with anyone any time uh, has experienced <laughs> this. <laughs> that was really generic, but really like, we want to get down to the topic of ghosting. Why does it happen? What, what causes it? What can we do about it? And uh, we figured this would be particularly interesting because I have a uh, strong history of not answering um, invitations and texts and sometimes calls. And uh, Christine is much better about that. So we have, we have two, <laughs> two viewpoints here. <laughs> well, and I have a strong aversion <laughs> to being ghosted. <laughs> <laughs> so we're definitely on the opposite end of the coin on this one. <laughs> the fact that we've worked together well for several years at this point is uh, a little bit of a miracle, but we did it. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's like we, we, we have two gigantic buttons that get pushed all the time. And yet we've found ways to not let them ruin the relationship. Yeah. So let's, let's dive in a little bit to what we really mean by ghosting. So first, there's like there's lots of different versions I see in the corporate world. I, I've seen things like it's very uh, apparent in the job search that, that it's very easy to send your resume to like 500 places and feel like you're just going into the void. You don't even get an answer. Or sometimes you'll get a couple of answers and it'll disappear. Um, I haven't been in the dating scene while there's been, you know, apps out, but that apparently is basically the theme of all online uh, app-based dating <laughs> is dating for some amount of time. And then just the person disappears. Uh, you never hear from them again, whether things were going well, not well, or in between. <laughs> so there's that. And then there's uh, like RSVPs for invitations. <laughs> yes. And thanks. Yes. Especially invitations that specifically ask for RSVPs because of contingency of and dependency on food and drink quantity, seating, cost, etc. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have any other th thoughts, of, uh, examples of ghosting you, you find particularly um, either common or annoying? <laughs> or both? <laughs> well, annoying all of them. Uh, all, all ghosting is annoying, but we'll get into that. Um, yeah, I think it's just a general, you know, you reach out to someone and that's it. Uh, you just kind of hear back. Uh, in the business world, I think it's specifically disrespectful uh, when someone has spent time either putting a proposal together or reaching out. Uh, in, in any case, there's been a significant investment of time and not even receiving an acknowledgement of, thanks, I've got this, I'll review it, I'll get back to you. Uh, it's a huge lack of disrespect. And that happens, I'm sure, a lot. Anybody that's in business development or, or sales or anything like that will, will be on the receiving end of that. Uh, and the, um, you know, and that's just general with people. It's like when you, when you reach out, I find that um, whether it's friends, family, anything, it's like you end up either pinging them over and over and over uh, and actually addressing the ghosting or, I don't know, retreating and, and assuming that you're bothering them and they hate you and you never reach out again. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely true in biz dev that there's a lot of unanswered things. I have plenty of um, pings from people from like, it seems like either bots or potentially recruiters mm -hmm. on like LinkedIn who will just come out of the blue or people who are, you know, selling a software product or something, it'll come ping out of nowhere on LinkedIn. And that one, I don't feel so bad for like ghosting. Like, I didn't, I don't know you, you don't know me. You're just, mm -hmm. you, you've hit with a very awkward pitch right off the bat. Um, that's one case where um, I, I guess I don't feel <laughs> as bad not answering. Even if they come back with like the fourth email that's the, mm -hmm. uh, that you didn't answer any of them, but the fourth email is like, yeah, I've been trying to get a hold of you for a while. Like, okay, yeah, but I get 40 of these. Yeah, I'm not going to spend my life yeah. answering a polite no to everybody who is trained to go send another email. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I agree. That means yeah. 
that being said, when you put the effort in, when you've already been had dialogue, when you're putting in a proposal or you put in a resume or something like that, that's that's work you've put in. Like if, if you're putting in a resume, presumably there's a job opening. So it you, would be you I think. Feel, incumbent on the company <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. You'd think. Uh, one, and I always look at it. <laughs> I always look at it from the point of view that time is the one resource we don't, we can't renew. Uh, and so if we're all cautious, uh, conscious about the time that people spend and the time we spend, um, as you mentioned, I, you know, I can be on my soapbox and the high horse on the high horse on the soapbox at the same time um, on, on the ghosting piece. And I don't always respond to unsolicited sales emails. Uh, I do get to the point that on the fourth one, I'm so annoyed that I'm still getting a sales email from somebody I'd never reached out to about a service or product that I never really wanted to discuss to begin with, that I do actually answer and say, thank you, not interested. And that usually stops the trend. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, definitely easy to um, kind of notify like, the people when it's very impersonal at that point. There's no actual relationship there. So let's talk about the more meatier ones where there is the relationship involved, right? If you're, you have a, an invite out um, it's to a party or it's just, you know, text back and forth to your friends that uh, stop answering. Yeah, I, I find there's, for me personally, I think it's a bit of just um, kind of a worry. Uh, I don't I don't like to have to come up with something, especially if like, somebody's inviting you to something, you're like, I don't have it in me to do that right now. It's hard just to say, um, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> e like e like Ewan would have a some... crack out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a bit of a boundaries issue, but it feels almost impolite to be like, look, it's not that I don't enjoy your company often. It's just that, you know, this week, whatever, I'm just, I'm not going to leave my house. It's not because I have plans. I plan on sitting on the couch, but I just can't make it to that. <laughs> well, and that brings up an interesting point, actually. It's the, this need to have a reason, maybe. Uh, and again, I'm not one that doesn't respond, so I'm speculating <laughs> why somebody <laughs> wouldn't respond here. Uh, but it's, you know, the, the, this need of like, we, there's this societal pressure of you're you're a cool person if you have plans all the time, uh, you're cool. You know you're you're accepted by society or you're accepted by in in the elite group or whatever whatever this group of magical people <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that are uh, in the coolness are are the ones that already have plans uh, are not just sitting on the couch uh, don't want to just sit at home and so because of that I I can see how Say no, because the answer is just no, I don't feel like leaving the house. Or it's just no, I just don't feel like it uh, can be difficult to, to deliver. I think it's also a little difficult because it sometimes feels like you're delivering the message. Um, that sounds great, but I'm going to place your priority second to my doing nothing. <laughs> Whatever you've invited me to is actually less important to me than what feels, what, you know, by other accounts might feel like doing nothing. And maybe, you know, it's been totally a long week and you're, you're done and, and mm -hmm. that's fine to say once or twice, but uh, I also have had the, uh, I don't know, experience of having to meet with a lot of people who are particularly sensitive about there having to be a response or some people who will really dig in and feel like, no, I'm sorry, I don't, I won't be able to make it. And I'm like, well, why not? What's, what's up? You're like, well, I, yeah, I just, I just can't make it. Like, well, what are you doing? Like, well, I have this obligation. Well, can you move it? Like, no, I said no. <laughs> Please stop asking. Yeah. Now that I can understand. Uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about this is because since we are on opposite side of the spectrum on this, um, I've gotten to the point where instead of always taking it personally when I don't get a response, uh, I've now moved into the curiosity of like, what is it that drives people to not respond? Uh, because I actually don't mind hearing no with no explanation. Just sorry, can't make it. That's it. That, that's the end of it. Like, it's like I, I find that from my end of the not liking to be ghosted, um, it's I find that hugely more respectful of the relationship and the humanness and the time spent than, a, you know, a, a no plus excuse or a 
or a no, no answer whatsoever. Um, and I, so I, I find that it's, it's nice to just hear, no, can't make it. And you want to tell me the reason? Great. You don't. Okay. It's not personal, it, you know, unless you're, you know, planning my murder or demise <laughs> or something, it's okay for me not to know. <laughs> <laughs> now if you could just convince everybody else to behave that way i don't think there'd be a lot of ghosting <laughs> for me personally i've spent i spent many years of, of many all kinds of different relationships close and, and professional and uh, that just have that feeling of like well well you know, you've got to have some reason that you're not doing this i mean this is something that i've, I've said that you should do i'm like well I, I don't really feel like doing that well yeah but i invited you <laughs> okay I don't want to go because I broke my arm. I don't know. I mean, what do you need to hear? <laughs> At which point you're lying to people, which feels a lot worse. <laughs> you could use COVID at this point. Yeah, that was, that was a nice, easy. Yes. <laughs> get out Sorry. No. Yeah. I've been exposed. I've talked to someone who's been exposed. I may have it. <laughs> uh, I have a runny nose. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I don't see people during a pandemic. I mean, it's it's beautiful. No, I, I get it. Uh, and I get it mainly because I remember when I had kids, well, when I got pregnant with my first child and then had kids, it was heaven. I was like, I now had like a token <laughs> reason to not do anything I didn't feel like doing. I'm like, sorry, I got kids. <laughs> I put that one in the pros column for having kids. <laughs> yes, it's a definite pro. And I also got into the point when once I turned 30, for some reason, I felt like I had permission to actually choose what I do and what I do not do. Uh, and so once I turned 30, I was like, okay, now I can just say no. That resonates uh, a lot with me as well. I think as, as you get older, it, it becomes a little bit easier. There's something, especially early on, and especially when it comes to careers and professional um, work, there is even, even later in careers, I suppose, there's a lot of pressure not to say no, especially if it's somebody who you know, is your supervisor or a boss or somebody who has some form of power over you, over what, you, what your career, your job, whatever. Um, it's a lot harder to establish that no it's still very necessary and usually if you can do it in a respectful manner it just ends up building the relationship but it's a very difficult mm -hmm. one especially as all of us have experienced some form of um toxic employers at some point where there is there's some boundary violation and there's some pushing even when it's like well i, I you know i am well i've already got four projects yeah but can you just take this one it's just going to be a couple of days <laughs> like sure. always is yeah it's always <laughs> just a couple of days <laughs> Yeah, go back to our episode on just for that one. <laughs> and it's actually it's been nice, like uh, having because you're you're very straightforward about uh, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm if if I haven't answered for a little while, you'll definitely point it out, and I don't feel uh, attacked in having it pointed out. I usually just feel bad because <laughs> I know that there's something I've been delaying on. But uh, we have a close enough relationship that then we've yeah. we've talked for long enough that it doesn't feel weird, and I, I'm not I don't feel like you're you know super angry or that there's some massive shame here and I don't feel really worried about get, being able to respond. It just sometimes things fall a little bit more by the wayside, but ironically, it's then easier to respond to you with whatever because I know you're going to take it well. So then I become not ghosting you because I know you're going to receive that and be able to push and create your own boundaries just fine. <laughs> by default, then I end up drifting towards that uh, what I would prefer to do in general anyway, but it's something that I don't see myself doing a lot in a lot of other arenas. Um, but it's just easier when I have an established relationship that I'm not like feeling like it's on a hair's edge at all times of they've just, they're going to decide I'm rude for this. And now, um, there's nothing else I can do. You know, that now, now I've ruined this relationship because I really was tired on a Friday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's a very good point. I think the the amount of trust that there is, is important. I think not being shamed, uh, feeling that your space is valued, uh, feeling that your decision to say no is valued and it's not taken uh, as an attack is very important. And as everything, it's about habit. So it's about like, oh, you know, like I, if I do this, I, am I going to get, you know, sucker punched? Oh, I didn't this time. Okay, let's try another time. Nope, still not getting sucker punched. Nope, still not. I'm like, oh, I think this is okay. And it goes both ways. It's like when, you know, when you're delayed in response or you don't respond, I don't immediately 
most times. Um, <laughs> I don't immediately think like, oh yeah, he's done. Uh, that's it. I, I can never, I can never call again. I can never text again. Uh, I'm about to get, you know, a lawyer letter telling me that the, the business is, <laughs> is being dissolved. Um, I don't automatically go down that route. Um, most of the times. Uh, and if I do, uh, sometimes it's, I realize it's about me and whatever state I'm in at the moment and whatever insecurity I'm dealing with that will most likely have nothing to do <laughs> with what's going on in the relationship. So this brings up an interesting point thing. I agree 100% that it becomes a lot easier when there's way more trust there. There's way less chance that, you know, you catastrophize over somebody not answering or you catastrophize over having to give an answer that, you know, that this is going to end a relationship or the relationship is already over and I'm just not hearing about it because um, it's over. It's in the void now. Uh, so it brings up an interesting point from both angles. One, one thing that I've worked on a little bit um, is, uh, trying just to get a little more comfortable and it's easier when I have a relationship like I have with you or I have with Rachel, there's, it's very easy to be like, look, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do this. I'm not willing to do this. Cause there's just already this established understanding. And so being able to practice essentially that skill with people where, you know, you you, you have a good chance of it being a much safer space to do that from my end, where I answer much less frequently, um, that has helped move the needle for me to where mm -hmm. I start to answer a lot more and I'm a lot less worried about doing it because there's, like you said, practice and examples of, okay, I didn't get sucker punched this time. So I don't know about from your end, what, what helps like understand, you know, for, if you're not getting an answer, mm -hmm. what helps diffuse some of that um, in your experience? That's a good question. I was just thinking about it actually, as you were saying that, and I think it's really the it's kind of ironic, but the consistency, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, not in the sense of the consistency of no response uh, or the consistency of response, but the actual consistency of both. Um, so, and, and, the, and the history and the time and, and, and the habits uh, and all of that. Uh, but I think it's it's almost like when you when you're at the beginning of a relationship, whether it's a friendship, a business relationship, you know, any kind of of human interaction, uh, there's a lot of I think building that trust, and that building that trust is testing the water. So you're trying to figure out like what what is this? Uh, how do I navigate? Um, you know, communicating with this person, and so at that beginning. When, you know, when it's constant no or constant ghosting or out of the blue ghosting, like one of the example that I have that still puzzles me, and I'm sure it's happened to me many times, is when there's actual conversation of, hey, let's go get drinks. And then when you reach out 20 minutes later <laughs> to say like, yeah, you know, like, okay, you know, like, you know, want to wanna plan this, um, when can you do it? And then you hear nothing. Uh, and then you reach out again and then you hear nothing. And the initial, I guess, intent wasn't even from me. <laughs> it was from the other person saying, let's schedule happy hour. That's when it's like, wait, I, I don't know what to do here. <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> the non-response when I wasn't even the one initiating the event. <laughs> uh, and so that's when you know, when you're still trying to figure out the communication, that's when it's tough. That's when I can see, you know, potential uh, business or, or friendships or any type of relationships fall apart because you're now in this kind of limbo state of, I, I don't understand what, what the silence means. And I don't know the person enough to, to give them the benefit of the doubt as bad as it is, as I say it out loud. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. The benefit of the doubt is incredibly important, and but it is hard to get without that. I mean, even if you do have a long-term relationship with somebody, uh, you can fall to starting to create a story of why they're not answering you. And even if you find out that that isn't true, it's hard to let go of what has already started building in your mind. So it's, it becomes like this, almost like um, building up some kind of sediment in a pipe. Like it might, you, you might not, not be blocked, but there's still some, something building up there that is slowly mm -hmm. kind of clogging the works. And uh, so there's 
two two interesting facets I'd like to discuss as well because both you and I have talked about this and joked about it and even joked about it when uh, with like having kids and being able to say like oh, I'm not going to do things. Um, I have a propensity. I really tend to enjoy a lot of social gatherings, um, but I do often have a lot of dread getting up to them. Like um, I, I will happily agree a week out because I, I know that I want to do this, and then the day of I'm like, oh my god, do I really have to do this? Like, <laughs> am I gonna have to like put on shoes and leave the house? And so I'm curious, um, since you you also have that feeling, what what do you feel? What how do you relate to that? What do you what do you feel like when you do that, and how do you get around it? <laughs> I'm not quite sure how I get around it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yes, I experienced the exact same thing. Um, I have this like almost like split personality um, where I want to get together with people. Uh, I need to get together with people. Like I, I do realize that I'm ridiculously drained of energy when I don't have consistent human contact and human connection. And at the same time, uh, it's almost like going to a concert for me. Uh, I like, I am super excited. I buy the tickets. I can't wait. And then the day or the day before having to go, I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> this like, do, I, <laughs> do I actually have to put clothes on and, and figure this out and get in the car and walk from the parking lot to the concert venue and all of that stuff. So I don't know why that happens. I don't know why the the change in the enthusiasm is. And then typically, I mean, and there are times where I go to gatherings and I'm like, what the hell am I here? I should have stayed home. Uh, <laughs> but usually I've got, I think I've gotten better at deciphering those ahead of time. Um, but usually I have an awesome time and I'm glad I went out, but it's that like, Oh, I really don't want to go. Can some, can a snowstorm please hit like right now? <laughs> <laughs> I remember some comedian, he's John Mulaney, he's talking about how, like, um, yeah, he's like, I've never done heroin, but I'm pretty sure that's what canceling plans feels like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so there's some joy in that of like, oh, thank goodness, I thought I was going to have to, like, go, yeah. like you said, get get ready, go out and do all the things. And, and I've realized that uh, there's so much little tiny bits of friction that can change a whole course of things like, uh, like working out. Um, I really enjoy swimming, but I almost never do it because there's like four extra layers on top yes. of like, I don't know, do you have to like get ready to go, to leave, to go, to get ready, to get into the pool, to get ready again, to get out, to go. And then there's like nine different, like, that's a lot of extra steps that end up being like that. Those little things can end up, um, really, piling up then I, I didn't really start consistently working out in my life until I started getting equipment and buying it and putting it in my house where I didn't have to leave <laughs> and that's like <laughs> all those things the friction was a lot less if it's already there in your room so. I'm starting to sense a theme yeah <laughs> Chase, as long as you don't have to leave your house you'll do anything but, but why is that because I also have that like I and the pandemic drove this point home like if, if you don't have some amount of human connection I I go a little nuts. Like, and I, I really do like being able to work from home. That's really nice. Like having the flexibility to do that. The lack of obligation to have to go into an office is wonderful, but I also enjoy when I go into offices because you get that interaction, you get to like uh, see people, talk to people, have those nice face-to-face -face meetings. And I don't know how to get my subconscious that is 30 minutes away from leaving on board with the fact that it's probably going to have a good time once it gets there. <laughs> Very good point. Yes, I, I was. I did realize that one thing that I never dread is hosting. So whenever people are coming to me to my house, whether it's a dinner party or tea or go for a walk, I never dread that. I actually look forward to it. So there is something about having to get dressed, figure out what the weather is. Is it going to change? Am I going to be warm? Am I going to be cold? Are my shoes going to be comfortable? Am I going to find parking? Is it going to be too far? Is it going to be too close? <laughs> Do I have to pay for it every two hours? Like all this extra stuff, like going swimming, that's what I dread. It's not the mm -hmm. actual being there that I dread. Yeah. And maybe it is uh, some amount of... Um... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I would say that you know, in a lot of circumstances, if there's not enough energy being provided by whatever you're doing, it's going to, you, mm -hmm. you will feel some dread or you'll feel some, some lagging from it. But given that oftentimes after seeing people, or if I get, if I finally, you know, get my boots on and go out and meet the people that I set out to meet, 
um, I feel great. I love it. And I come back home. I feel more energized. I was really glad that I, you know, really glad that I did that. Um, so it, it doesn't quite, you know, follow that it, it's a lack of energy or that the actual event mm-hmm. isn't enough. It's, so it's this weird, like, I guess maybe we're, we get really hung up on the details of what has to happen up to that point. And maybe that's the same with not answering, you know, uh, messages or something. If you have to come up with, or, or even, even a question, uh, sometimes I find myself doing this when somebody asks an open-ended question, I'm like, I have lots of thoughts on this. I'll, I'll think about that and get back to that. Mm-hmm. And like days and days can pass where I come back to that. And I'm like, yeah, I still have a lot of thoughts on that. And, or I, I have them <laughs> forming in my head and I still don't like, but even just responding to like, Hey, I've got a lot to say about this. Give me, give me a little time to put it together would be better than just waiting for days before I finally, you know, put it all on paper and get it out there. So maybe it's something about like the understanding and maybe I need to be more conscious of this personally of like, yeah, there's details that'll have to go into it, but like when have details ever actually like squandered something, like even if your shoes are uncomfortable, does that mean the night's ruined? Probably not. <laughs> Depending not on the outing. Unless I'm walking unless it's 20 hiking. miles. <laughs> Yeah. but you know, it's a small enough detail maybe it's just you know it's enough to get by and maybe it's weird to it, it just takes more conscious effort to not get hung up on the specific details and i'm, I'm not sure yeah well and there's always also a, a layer of vulnerability in anything whenever we show up whether it's with somebody we trust or who we're comfortable with um we're always it's vulnerability i mean you know stay, staying home even behind a screen it's much less vulnerable and vulnerability comes with being uncomfortable. It's like, you know, what if I show up and I have spinach in my teeth? What if I get spinach in my teeth while I'm there and nobody tells me? <laughs> um, you know, what if I say something wrong? What if this, you know, interaction, which I can always trust on, I tonight I say the wrong thing and that's it. And then it ruins the relationship. Um, so there's, there's always some element of risk, I think, uh, involved, which may be the reason why people ghost. Um, and there's element of risk in saying, no, there's element of risk in saying, Hey, you know, that's a great question. And I need some time to think about it, uh, because we can't fully predict what the reaction on the other end is going to be. And it's probably better to take that time to think about it too, in any kind of boundary setting. And we, we talked about this uh, in our burnout panel. We've talked about that with Emer, like knowing what you are willing to say yes to and how much mm-hmm. you're willing to say yes to, which almost by default is not just saying yes to everything. Because unless you know whatever that person is about to offer is already within the, you know, this is something that definitely is something I value, something worth my time and something I want to spend the time on and sacrifice that time that I would be able to spend on something else doing that. Uh, unless you know those to be a yes beforehand, you should probably be taking time to consider answers anyway, but mm-hmm. uh, not to the point of not answering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and Emer actually was the one that taught me a very important lesson, which I'm still practicing and trying to remember to practice, um, especially in business, but I think it's very valid and personal as well, is when something comes our way, Um, the things we should say yes to that we know we can be fully present for and be our best selves for and have the the most amount of value given the time that's not a renewable resource for for are the ones that are a heck yes Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think a lot of times we are conditioned to think about things that if it's not a heck no then it's a yes but there's a gigantic gray area between a heck no and a heck yes. Uh, and so practicing that, I was like, is this a heck yes? And heck yes usually come pretty quickly. You don't have to think about it. If you have to think about it, then it's not a heck yes. <laughs> um, and so that's, I think, a big thing to, to practice uh, and to start using and, and then starting getting comfortable with like, is it a heck yes? No. Okay. Then let's get comfortable saying no. Because yeah. this is going to happen over and over and over. And getting good at asking yourself if that will bring that answer faster. That you're yes. practicing that and you'll, you'll be better at uh, immediately finding that answer for yourself. And then it's easier to say no, especially if you have practiced no. <laughs> yes. Most things in life are not going to be a heck yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. just how it goes. Yeah. So, and some so- things we have to do. So, I mean, I, I have to go to the grocery store whether I like it or not. So as much as it's never a heck yes, 
<laughs> or only sometimes, <laughs> I'm going to have to do it uh, yeah. if I actually want to eat and feed the rest of the family. <laughs> I too need clothes occasionally, so yeah. I want to do laundry at some point. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Laundry is never a heck yes. Yeah. No. I mean, if you are bouncing out of your bed doing that, great. Um, start a service, please, and come yeah. to my house. Uh, <laughs> for free. <laughs> uh, I think it's, uh, you know, for me, a lot of the, the propensity to ghost comes from two things from not, uh, from feeling worried about having to set some kind of boundary, feeling like it's boundary, from feeling like the answer is to, or from feeling like there's something more complex that I'd like to put more time and effort towards than I will be able to in a quick response, um, which a lot of the times, that's a self-imposed limit that people are asking for some quick response. If they've asked a question that's complex, there's a good chance they're looking for a more complex answer, but um, maybe in, in that way, it would help to start these things with a little more empathy. <laughs> you know, what, what are they really looking for? And what are the chances of what they'll do? And then also start it maybe from, hey, what would I do? You know, I'm not, I, I think we, we get worried that, you know, we're going to be judged because maybe we judge people and we, we worried that mm -hmm. somebody else is going to do that. And so if that's the case, then, if we have to reduce the judgment we have of other people, um, if, if they say no, uh, if they don't do something, um, that, or we just have to continually come back to, wow, that person really, really flipped out and really didn't like that I put up mm -hmm. a boundary there. That, uh, but that doesn't mean that boundaries are bad. That might just be this person or this situation yes. or this one time. Yeah. And that and takes that, a lot of patience. <laughs> yes. And that that is very difficult when, especially when we don't, usually put out boundaries uh, and then we do. And the reaction is drastically bad. <laughs> 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 Not just from an immediate reaction, but from a, you know, just loss of friendship uh, and end of uh, the good communication. That's when the default can definitely be to retreat and be like, I'm never going to put up a boundary ever again, because then I lose people and I'm going to end up alone and our, you know, our, our human instinct and our pre-wired need to always be in human connections with others can definitely kick in and prevent us from doing that. Um, so it's, it's more of that trust of like, okay, let's, let's actually look back into uh, history and is it true that every time we've put up a boundary of any kind, people have left? Or is it this specific relationship or certain specific types of relationships which could actually indicate something else that we probably need to dig into? <laughs> I think that's 100% uh, accurate. And maybe it really is down to, uh, I think it's definitely some learned habits, which means it's kind of imperative on both of us. We talk about authenticity being the social contract of like, I'm going to bring myself and I'm going to allow the space that other people can be themselves knowing that won't be exactly like me. And I think there's some of that in, um, ghosting, there's, there's the, I, I need to bring myself, um, and, and be fair and, and open and say, give, give my boundaries. Um, and then I also need to have the grace when somebody's putting a boundary up, even if I don't mm -hmm. want to have that boundary, you know, if you're being rejected from a job or if you're, uh, if mm -hmm. you just, you know, your friends turn you down an invite when there's something you wanted to do or whatever, uh, then you have to have the grace on the other side so that you can keep opening up the world so that it's a little easier for everybody to have that space. Um, cause it is a bit of a two way street, but to your point, it's um, not a, not usually a successful strategy to just pull back into your shell and say, I'm never going to set up a boundary again. You'll end up exhausted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You will end up exhausted. Uh, and it's also not probably um, long-term success or long-term pleasant to, to retreat into the shell and be like, I'm never going to talk to people again. Or yeah. never, you know, because when I do, they don't respond. Or when I do, when I set up boundaries, they, they respond badly or whatever it is. Um, from an introvert per point of view, it is easier uh, to kind of be like, yeah, I'm done. Just erase me from the world. I'm going to be happier that way. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how long that can last successfully. Uh, but there is definitely that initial instinct of like, yep, just, you know what? I am going to disappear. That's it. Yeah, it takes courage to continue to put yourself out there as well as continue to have um, respectful boundaries that you set and walls you put up. Yeah, yeah. So maybe my takeaway is when I haven't established the trust yet, 
and I haven't, uh, and I'm still trying to figure out what the communication is and what's going on is to not automatically think, oh, I've been ghosted. I should just retreat, but it's to actually call it out. I think it actually does help. It takes even more courage because now you're essentially almost taking yourself out twice. Just the first invite yes. as well as the call out. Yeah. On the flip side, like you were saying, when you're when you're forming relationships, mm-hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of putting your toe forward and trying to figure out where lines are with people who, you know, how who these people are, how much are you willing to mm-hmm. um, how much are they willing to bend or not bend. Uh, and it's actually much more beneficial to establish good boundaries at that point. Yeah, you know, for one, because it establishes the trust up front. Mm-hmm. But then everybody kind of knows the ground they're playing on. There's a lot less ambiguity. There's, you know, I, I understand that I, I want to be able to respond here. And if I can't, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'll let you know or whatever. There's there's having those boundaries set up a little bit sooner and uh, recognizing the patterns of when the people don't respect those boundaries. Because there are definitely mm-hmm. people who will not. And that doesn't mean that it's bad to set boundaries, but it may be worth reevaluating that specific relationship. Yes, definitely. Uh, from, I think from the... I guess, giving end or from the uh, initiating end, uh, it would be helpful as part of the boundaries to actually give some grace uh, in the sense of when, you know, if we're sending a text or asking a, an elaborate question, then recognize that the answer may take some time and verbalize that. Uh, so actually say like, hey, you know, like this is, you know, a it's a significant question and you may need some time to answer and that's okay. No rush. Or can you just give me some quick thoughts uh, by whatever? So kind of giving parameters of what are my expectations here on, on getting an answer? Uh, and is it an expectation that's more existential, meaning I just want to make sure that you remember I exist or is it an expectation of, you know, I just, you know, want to make sure that this is on your radar. And I think that's super helpful, not only because it gives parameters for the relationships, but it also allows, uh, I find uh, personally, whenever I can set that kind of line, um, you, your mind can put it down. It's not wondering Mm -hmm. like how long is the right amount of time. It's saying, well, I I said that I'd follow up again if I hadn't heard back by Thursday. So I can basically put Mm -hmm. this whole train of thought and circle out of my head until Thursday. because I know there's now a timeline. These parameters help both sides Mm -hmm. of the relationship to Give it the, yeah, we always think it, it, it'd be better to have more freedom and more choice, but mm-hmm. creativity always works a little bit better with a little, little structure, a little bit of boundary, a little bit of something to push against some, some definition, not just total blank open space. <laughs> yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And even from the business point of view, I think it helps a lot. Uh, it helps everybody to understand where they're at. It helps, um, again, like take this spiral out of, of the, out of the possibility uh, and the wondering what to do next when there's clear communication of like, hey, you know, like I'm sending this out. And if I don't hear from you, I'll reach out again next week. Uh, and on the other hand, like we just experience, you know, from a client point of view who was upfront about saying like, hey, we're going to have to think about uh, the strategy you guys put together. And if you don't hear from me by February, please reach out. So now there's an established I don't have to sit here for the next five weeks wondering like, okay, is this a good moment to call? Do I, do I wait another week? Are they trying to tell us that they don't want to work with us? Like what's going on? Like not, all of that, it's gone. And it's such a huge mental space that can really detract us from putting energy in other things. Yeah. And the other way I've heard that asks, which uh, I love the idea of like being able to proactively say like, Hey, if you don't hear back from me, please, uh, you know, feel free to ping me again. I've started doing that with a lot more relationships. Um, but also one that I've heard a couple of times now that I really like is I've heard people say, when can I check back on that? Uh, yes. is it been, and it's not, not an aggressive, like, okay, mm-hmm. well, yeah, I was supposed to have that now. When can I check back? Can I, can I do two hours back? Can I do, it was just like, so uh, I totally understand you're busy. When, when should I ask about this again? Then it just creates that dialogue and there's better set expectations. Yeah, there definitely is. Well, so it sounds like we've resolved ghosting. Yeah. So that's it. No more ghosting. <laughs> I'm sure it will just vanish. I was thinking about the that. fact that especially in dating apps, somebody has to come up with some bot that sends a little ghost emoji. <laughs> I mean, at least, you know, 
You've been ghosted. Yeah. Here's your emoji. Done. Drop it. Move on. Yeah. Even just the app, like it doesn't even have to send it from the person. Just say, yeah. you dropped this conversation. Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's enough AI out there. It can pull like names and numbers out of your text messages. Surely it can determine whether this was an ongoing conversation that suddenly yeah. stopped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it shouldn't be that hard at all. <laughs> Let's make that thought. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's our business idea. The, go- <laughs> the little dancing ghost bot. <laughs> Siamo ghosts. <laughs> uh, Gotta go with the well, trend. This has been our first in a, a more bite sized version of the podcast where we're going a little bit shorter and we just want to cover one topic in depth. But thank you mm-hmm. guys so much for listening in. Please feel free to follow up with any of your thoughts on ghosting or why you do it and ways you found to avoid it because we'd love to include them and love to put them out yeah, there. Exactly. And if you don't reach out, we won't take it personally. <laughs> this is an open invite this is like an unsolicited sales email it's okay if you don't answer yes <laughs> we won't be offended <laughs> thank, thank you, you everybody for listening <laughs> <laughs>